Welcome to Concordia. We are so glad you've joined us here for worship today. Our service will be about an hour long and include music, scripture, and an encouraging message for your week ahead. Our free app provides a worship guide and sermon notes if you want to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your app store. If you are joining us for the first time today, we'd love to meet you. You are invited to stop by one of the welcome kiosks in the lobby so we can say hi, answer any questions you may have, and give you a special gift as a reminder of your time here. Each week, our Sunday school hour begins at 9.30, including adult Bible class that dives deep into God's Word, Bible studies for junior high and high school students, as well as Sunday school classes for kids ages pre-K-3 through 5th grade. Concordia seeks to share God's love through service and our ongoing Love Essay program. If you are interested in volunteering here on campus or in the community, you can find the current opportunities online at concordia.cc slash loveessay. Worship is about to begin. Thank you for being here today, and we hope you enjoy your time at Concordia. You are always welcome here. Hey, good morning, Concordia family. We're so excited you're here. Let's stand up and let's sing this song together.
Good morning. Please be seated. It's good to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here. Glad for those who are in the sanctuary and for those who are online, welcome to Concordia. You know, this morning we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Some of you have come very appropriately celebratory dress, attire, whatever. And so, but, uh, you know, in addition to St. Patrick's Day, we're also celebrating God's Word, the Lord's Supper. In fact, after this service, we'll have a baptism. So it's a wonderful, full morning. And so will you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this day, for your goodness and mercy, for your love and care for us. Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering around word and sacrament and fellowship with you and with one another. And bless us, Father, for this time that we spend, that we would be strengthened in body and mind to serve you with our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing another song. We invite you all to stand up and sing with us this, this song as well. salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free. All praise, all praise to God our Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' name.
You may be seated. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come into worship this morning, we recognize that God is holy and he is good and he is gracious and he is just and we look at ourselves and we take stock of our lives and we recognize that we are not always good. We're not always holy. We don't always live as God asks us to live. And so as we come into worship, it's important that we come before God in a time of repentance, recognizing that we are sinful and more importantly, clinging to the promise that whenever we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and that he loves to forgive. And so as we go into worship, I invite you to kneel or remain seated as you're able as we go into a time of confession. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, for the chance to worship you. But God, we recognize as we come into worship today that we're bringing all sorts of baggage, Lord, in, in terms of the ways that we've failed throughout this week. Things that we've done and things that we've failed to do, relationships that are fractured, hope that's been lost, Lord. We come to you and we lay it all before you, confessing our sin. Hear the good news of the gospel. Almighty God is rich in mercy and has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you of all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I announce to you that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Please rise for the reading of the scripture. The scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, where we read verses 66 through 69. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. The children in the balcony are invited to come down at this time for the children's message. Please join with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. Please be seated as the children come forward for the children's message. your shoe, baby. It's untied. Let's see. I think we're just about there. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I am so glad to see you. And uh, I wonder if you remember, so... Next week is Palm Sunday, and then we have Holy Week, and then comes Easter. Easter! Yeah, and, and I don't know, has anybody ever been, have you ever been to the Easter egg hunt? 
That comes on Saturday before Easter. I hope you'll come again. It's going to be an awesome time. It's always so much fun. But you know, as I was thinking about that, today is a holiday too, right? Who knows what holiday? In unison, St. Patrick's Day, right. And I see, so how many wore green, especially for St. Patrick's Day? Congregation, how many of you wore green, especially for St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, I want you to notice I have green on my socks. Okay, no pinching me, right? But you know, when I think about, when I think about St. Patrick's Day, so St. Patrick's Day has St. Patrick. He was a person who lived. And then we've got green clothes, and I don't know if you know this, but sometimes people make their food green. We've got green food, and we've got clovers, green rivers. We've got leprechauns. I mean, St. Patrick's Day has a lot of stuff. But you know, St. Patrick didn't know about most of that stuff. St. Patrick didn't have anything to do with leprechauns, didn't have anything to do with green food or green rivers, didn't have anything to do with a lot of the stuff we think about. In fact, who knows what St. Patrick did? What did he do? Man, you are a thousand percent right. Yeah, what he said is Ireland didn't know God, and they didn't. They weren't just like kind of Christians, but not really. They didn't know anything about Jesus. They didn't know anything about walking with God. And St. Patrick went and he preached the gospel. He told them all about Jesus, all about God's love for them, and lots and lots of people came to faith. That's what St. Patrick's Day is all about. I mean, all the rest of it is fun, right? But the really important part of St. Patrick's is that Pat, St. Patrick was a preacher who shared Jesus and people came to faith. In fact, there are lots and lots of people in the world who go to faraway places. We call them missionaries, right? Missionaries who go and share the message of God's love so that people in other places and other cultures can know about Jesus. In fact, I want to pray about that. Will you join me as we pray about those missionaries? Dear God, thank you for your love. And for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you for missionaries like St. Patrick. Bless them, protect them, and allow their work to be filled with your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great job, everybody. You did a wonderful job this morning. You can head back to your seats. I hope you have a great St. Patrick's Day and a great week ahead. God bless you. As the kids make their way back to their seats, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to receive the offering at this time. Thank you for all the different ways that you participate in the ministry of Concordia, whether it's through your time, uh, dedicating yourself to volunteer projects or through, through your efforts or through your talents or, or through the, the money that you give to support this ministry. We appreciate the way that you have partnered with us as we seek to live like St. Patrick lived, to bring the gospel message to our community, to spread the love of Jesus to the ends of the earth, but especially here in San Antonio through the way we love, live, and shine. And so we thank you for your partnership in this ministry. If we have any guests with us this morning, I I wanna welcome you to Concordia. Anyone watching online, welcome to Concordia. We're glad you're streaming this morning. If you are a guest, as you leave service this morning, in in the lobby, there will be a gift waiting for you. It's a small token of our appreciation. We hope that you will consider making Concordia your home church. If you're a guest or visitor from out of town, I know we've got some people from Zion in the front pews, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We hope that you feel at home at Concordia. You are always welcome here.
We have the chance in just a second to go into a time of prayer. We strongly believe in the ministry of prayer here at Concordia. And if you are a person that's in need of prayer because you're going through a difficult life circumstance or you want to celebrate something or there's someone you know that needs prayer, I would encourage you to submit a prayer request either through Concordia's website, concordia.cc, or through the app. Or if you want to pray today with prayer partners, there will be people at the front of the sanctuary who would love to pray with you. And they will keep your prayers confident and they will continue to pray for you throughout the week. And you can trust and know that you are being covered in prayer. And so I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Right now, let's go before our God in the time of prayer. You can kneel or remain seated as you prefer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of prayer that you invite us into your house to offer thanksgiving and to pray for those things that we need. And so, Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for all the many ways that you've provided for us. Lord, we give you great thanks for that. But Lord, we recognize that we have so many needs and we are dependent on you. And so today we come praying for a number of things. We pray for all the wars and the conflicts that are taking place throughout our world. We remember especially the war between either Ukraine and Russia. We pray that you would preserve innocent lives, that you'd bring peaceful resolution. We pray for the war between Hamas and Israel. Lord, we pray for the protection of Palestinian lives, of Israeli lives, of all those who are innocent that are caught in the fire. We pray that you would protect and preserve and bring peace and a resolution to that war. Father God, we pray that you would work through the governments of the world. We pray that you would work through our own government, through our elected officials and leaders, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and discernment and how to operate in the days ahead. Lord, that you would bring uh, an end to all hostility, that you would bring provision in those places that are worn, torn, and ravaged by disease. We pray for the work of your church here in San Antonio and all throughout the world. We remember especially missionaries, Lord, that carried the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we pray for our brothers and sisters that suffer persecution this morning. Remember, especially those in Pakistan, Lord, that you would bless and protect them, that you would sustain them with the peace of your Holy Spirit, Lord, as they seek to live out the calling that you have given them. Father, we pray for San Antonio. We pray for all those that live here. We pray that our church community would be a blessing to San Antonio. And we pray for those who serve in unique capacities within our communities, doctors and firefighters, police officers, elected officials, Lord, those who, who sacrifice daily to provide for the need of this community. Bless them in their work, Lord. Lord, all these prayers we bring before you when we take a moment of silence to pray for those people on our heart. Lord, we bring these prayers before you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the power. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. So for those who have been around for the last few weeks, you know that in this season of Lent, which began back on Ash Wednesday, we've been in a series called That's a Great Question. And the idea is that there are lots of questions that we have, lots of questions that we ask. In fact, lots of questions that that the people in the Bible ask of Jesus or God. But the really insightful questions 
really powerful questions are the questions that God or Jesus specifically asks of us. And today, the, the question that he's going to ask is a powerful one. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But we're in John chapter 6. And John chapter 6 is a really fascinating chapter because there's a transition that happens in John chapter 6. So it's 71 verses long. So it's one of the longer chapters in the New Testament. It has a wide range of things that happen. Most of it happens in the synagogue at Capernaum. And the, the real sort of striking transition is that it moves from Jesus gathering more and more people to himself, bigger and bigger crowds, more and more followers, and his popularity is growing like crazy. And over the course of chapter six in John's gospel, we see that change. We see the beginning of that shift where now people begin to be disgruntled and frustrated and they begin to walk away. But to, to get us started, John chapter 6 begins with the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I want you to just think about what that means in terms of Jesus' popularity. So he gathers 5,000 people up in Galilee, which is a rural area. He gathers 5,000 people without any media blitz, without any social media profile whatsoever. And the 5,000, by the way, probably is an indication of just the men, not everyone. So 5,000 plus people are gathered out on a hillside where Jesus teaches and he preaches. And, and this has been going on for a while because everywhere that Jesus goes, everywhere that, that he makes a stop, more and more people come to him. More and more people hear of his miracles, they hear of his teaching. And when we get to this section of John's gospel, the thing that the people absolutely adore about Jesus is that he feeds them, right? I mean, think about it. Food security in the first century in Galilee was not like food security today. The idea that, that you can go to your pantry, you can go to your refrigerator, you can go to your freezer, or you can just pop over to H-E-B, unheard of. And so the fact that they show up and they're out there all day long and Jesus recognizes their need and he feeds them, they don't care how he does it or what he does, the fact that he's able to feed them, make them so charged with enthusiasm for Jesus that it says Jesus knew that they wanted to make him their king. And they wanted to make him their king because he provided bread. So Jesus ultimately steps away. And uh, the story that comes next is the story where the disciples head across to Capernaum. So I brought a, a picture. If you looked just a little bit north of Hippus, there on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, that's probably where Jesus was for this feeding of the 5,000. And all the way over in the northwest kind of corner is Capernaum. And so he sends the disciples to take off. Jesus stays behind and prays. And then in the middle of the night, you know, there's a big storm and Jesus comes walking across on the water to the disciples. Well, then what follows is that they, they get to the shore. They're in Capernaum. And all of these people who are looking for Jesus all the time, they find him and say, how in the world, when did you get here? And Jesus begins to teach them. He begins to talk to them about, about reality, and he calls it out. He, he literally sort of cuts right to the chase, and he says, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Right? I mean, he puts his finger right on it. You don't want me because of the signs. You don't want me because you're convinced I'm the Messiah, because you think that I'm sent from God. You want me because you ate bread and were full. And then he goes on to, to talk about his ministry and his work, and he calls himself the Son of Man, and he concludes with this statement, for on him, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So then they ask him, what must we do to do the works of God? And what that means is the, the people know that they, the most prominent religious figures in the society are the Pharisees. 
And they're well-respected, and they're, they're honored religious leaders. But remember, the Pharisees have added 613 laws and rules on top of the Ten Commandments. And so the, the people who are around Jesus are thinking, okay, so if, if you have a new message, if you are God's prophet, if you are his, his, this, the, new, the new Moses, then maybe you have something new that we're supposed to do, something we have to add to our religion in order to please God. So they say... What are the works we must do, what, uh, pardon me, what must, mu- what must we do to do the works God requires? And look at what Jesus says. The work of God is this. What must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus responds, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Isn't that amazing? Are you catching the difference? They're thinking about stuff that they have to do, and Jesus says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, there's not stuff you have to do. There is believing in the one that God sent, and that work is God's work. That's what God does. We'll come back to that. So the people respond. I mean, it's just amazing, the, the, the blindness of the folks who are around them. But truth be told, if it were you and me, we'd be blind too, because their hearts and their minds are focused on what? Bread. Give us bread. And so they say, show us a sign. They want more bread. And Jesus says to them, I'm the bread of life. In fact, he makes seven I am statements. And this is the very first, I am the bread of life. And then he goes on to explain and talk about that. And it's a very difficult conversation. And it's very hard to understand. And it sounds like he's saying that, that, that uh, well, it doesn't, it's hard. What is he saying? What is he talking about? And the people are confused, and ultimately, they begin to grumble, and they begin to complain. And finally, lots of them walk away. You can imagine, well, this guy's not going to give us bread. I'm going home. This guy's talking in riddles. I, I'm out of here. What? I am the bread of life. We're supposed to eat your flesh and drink your blood. What? I'm leaving. And lots and lots of people stop following me. Do you see, this is what I'm talking about. How John chapter six moves from this place where more and bigger crowds and they're gathering, they're desperate to find him and they're searching for him everywhere he goes to all of a sudden, things shift. And people begin to walk away. And what's striking about this is it's not just the people who have gathered. Some of his disciples begin to walk away. Now, I need to clarify something. In John chapter 6, where we're talking about disciples, remember that in addition to the 12 disciples, there are also lots of other people, women and men, probably families that, that traveled with Jesus, that, that learned from him, that watched his miracles. They were Pardon me, they were disciples. They were with him. They were learning from him. And you need to remember that that's distinct from when we talk about the 12 because when we're talking about the 12, we're talking about those 12 men that we specifically think of as Jesus' disciples. That makes sense? So it says, some of his disciples began to desert him. They began to walk away. And this brings us to the question, that Jesus asks. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Now, that's the NIV translation, and there's nothing wrong with that translation. There's nothing inaccurate or misleading about it, but I want you to, I want you to understand what the Greek says because there's a, an emphasis, a nuance I want you to have in mind because I think it's really important for the message today. Literally, what it says in Greek is that Jesus asked his disciples, you don't want to go away, do you? You don't also want to go away, do you? And the thing that I want you to hear there is that word want. Do you have that desire? Do you have that urge, that impulse? Are you feeling like you need to to wander off as well? The reason I think that's so important is because I think every follower of Jesus from that time until today has had the impulse, the thought, 
the moment where they say, should I walk away? Should I continue to follow him? I mean, literally, think about what he's saying. If we take that from a, from a negative into a positive, Jesus is saying, do you want to go away? Do you want to stop following me also? Now, why would we want to? Well, have you ever been frustrated with God? Have you ever been angry with God? Have you ever prayed for something that you absolutely in your heart and mind know and believe is the right thing and what God should be doing and he doesn't do it? Have you ever seen an injustice that you were convinced should be corrected? We all have. I think all of us have been in that place where where God seems to have let us down. In fact, I have to tell you, one of, the, one of the points at which John chapter six became very, very important to me was after we lost our son, Nick. You know, Nick had been through all kinds of struggles and trials, all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues, and, and we and lots of other people had been praying fervently that God would deliver him, that God would protect him, that God would save him, that God would get his feet back on the right path, that, that he would live And God said no. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't think that I was so much angry with God as just truly and profoundly disappointed in God. How could he miss this? How can this possibly be his will? How could this be according to his plan? What in the world is going on in heaven that this was the right direction. Have you been there? My goodness, if you haven't, God bless you. Because there are a whole bunch of us who have. And there's that thought in our hearts and thought in our minds What's the point? In fact, I I was thinking about that in the context of last week's message when Jeff talked about Matthew chapter 11 and he talked about that little poem that Jesus quotes. And essentially, remember the point was, God's not gonna dance according to your tune. God's not gonna do what you expect him to do. He's not gonna always be who you expect him to be. He's not gonna make all things go away. God isn't here to be the genie and we rub the, the the lamp, and the genie does whatever we want. That's not who God is. But man, sometimes it sure would be nice. Jesus says to the disciples, are you going to leave also? Do you want to? And this is one of those moments where Peter, Peter comes shining through. Remember, Peter has lots of places where he drops the ball. But this is a place where he takes the ball and he crosses the goal line. Because he says, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I can read that, you know, like this great victory. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But I don't think that's how Paul, uh, Peter said it. I think Peter was just like the rest of the disciples. I think Peter was disillusioned. I think he was confused. I think he was afraid. I think he was trying to grasp whatever in the world that Jesus was saying. Remember, this is a hard teaching. And Peter is just like the rest of the disciples. If you remember, Peter has a sword under his garment. Peter is ready at a moment's notice to to brawl, to fight, to defend Jesus, to conquer Rome. And that's who he believes Jesus is. He believes he's the Messiah. He believes God sent him. But he believes that Jesus is going to drive out the Romans. He's caught up in everything else that the rest of the disciples are caught up in. And now Jesus is talking about being the bread of life. He's talking about all of these things. It's confusing. And in fact, if he keeps talking that way, he's never going to get to fight the Romans. He's going to end up being killed by the Jewish leaders and the rest of them with him this isn't a great statement of victory by Peter this is a desperation statement I imagine Peter saying 
Well, we'd kind of like to leave, but where else would we go? You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. Do you hear what he's saying? I want to. I'm frustrated and disappointed and scared and upset and confused. But you have the words of eternal life. In fact, listen to how he puts the rest of the statement. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. You know, you know how it works in our world. There are things that are popular and successful, right? And when things become popular and successful, especially with all of the media attention and social media, people are jumping on board all the time, right? Piling on, piling on, piling on, kind of like Jesus' ministry, more and more people, more and more enthusiasm, more and more excitement. We all like to be part of something that's successful and on a roll. And when things begin to turn bad, when things begin to go south, when it looks like it's gonna fall apart, what happens? People start bailing out, right? You know the phrase? Like rats leaving a sinking ship. That's where Peter is. Lord, it seems like this ship is sinking. But it's the only ship in town. You're the only one with the words of eternal life. And besides that, We know and believe you are the Holy One of God. Because remember what I told you they witnessed just shortly before this? They're out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the midst of this storm and they're convinced they're all gonna die and lo and behold, Jesus comes walking along on top of the water. Remember Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, okay, come on. Peter gets out and begins to walk toward Jesus and he freaks out and Jesus has to reach down and save him. And the disciples were absolutely astonished at what they saw, just like you and I would be. They were there when Jesus raised a boy off his funeral pier, out of his funeral procession, raised him to life again. And of course they were there. Earlier in the same chapter when Jesus said, well, we've got 5,000 people here. Let's feed them. The disciples are like, what? You're crazy. We, there's no way. We can't, there's not even a store, and we don't have the money to buy it. And Jesus said, okay, well, what do we have? And they said, well, we've got this little boy. He's got just a few provisions. And Jesus said, perfect. Start feeding. And they feed everyone to the full, and they end up with 12 baskets left over. I mean, these disciples have seen some things, right? And what's interesting to me is you and I, we don't have the benefit of seeing all of the things that Peter saw. But we do have the opportunity to see God at work. You know, we talk about prayer all the time. Dear friends, if you you haven't committed yourself to be intentional in prayer, I'm pleading with you, start today. Have a little discipline about it. Make a list. Make a list of the things you're praying for, and if you really want the experience, then not only make a list of the things you're praying for, but but leave a space for you to write down when that prayer is answered and date it. Because what's gonna happen is over time, you're gonna be able to, to create a list, not only of prayer requests that will be long, 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 but you'll begin to fill in those answers to prayer. Do you know what it does to look back over that list? When you're asked to pray for something that seems impossible, when you're asked to pray against cancer or pray against a broken marriage or pray against kids that are struggling or pray against jobs that are lost, when you're praying about these things that seem impossible, but you can look back on that same list and see all the places where God has come through, you know what that does? It makes you say, Lord, We know and believe you are the Holy One of God. You know, I've talked to you so many times about tithing. And I've told you I love to preach about tithing. Not because I want to preach about money. Not because I want to preach, you know, bring more money to church or get in your pocket. I love to preach about tithing because tithing is about faith. 
Tithing is the only place where God says, test me in this and see if I won't keep my promise. Because essentially what tithing comes down to is he invites us to take 10% of what he provides to us, 10% of what we need to survive on and return it to him for the work of his kingdom. And he says, test me and see if I won't more than make up for that. And brothers and sisters, I will tell you, in, in Julie and my life and in the lives of so many others sitting right in the pews with you, we have seen God keep his promise. We have seen God's faithfulness and provision to that very promise come through over and over and over again. So the fact is, I don't get to see all the stuff that Peter saw. But I do get to see God at work if I just take the time, if I just have the faith to look. But let's be honest, even in the midst of all of that, when it seems like God has let us down, it triggers all kinds of emotions. It triggers all kinds of reactions. And sometimes we are so frustrated, so disappointed, so discouraged, so afraid, so confused, we feel like we wanna walk away feel like we want to stop trusting him. Feel like we better just take it into our own hands. Do it our own way. You know, what's really interesting about this passage is if you know the story of Peter. So Peter, no matter how you interpret his words, where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stick with you. When they get to the, to the Last Supper, where Jesus gives Holy Communion, Monday, Thursday, Jesus says, Peter, you need to understand something. You're going to deny that you even know me. Not once, twice, three times. Peter says, no way, no, 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 no way, Jesus. I would die before I would disown you. And then just a short while later, they're in the garden. And Jesus asked Peter and James and John to go with him a little further into the garden and pray with him. And remember what those faithful disciples do instead? Probably what I would do too. They fall asleep. And they wake up to all kinds of commotion and there are soldiers approaching Jesus and it looks like they're gonna take him away. And so Peter jumps up and remember that sword that he has under his, under his tunic? He pulls out his sword and he chops off the ear of the high priest's servant because Peter is determined. He is not gonna disown Jesus. He is ready to fight to Jesus. He's ready to fight to the death. He will do whatever is required. There's no way. Peter is a rough and tough guy who's here to see the kingdom of God ushered in and he's gonna do battle. And Jesus rebukes him. He says, Peter, what in the world are you doing? I mean, Peter thinks that, that he's helping Jesus. Peter thinks this is the moment. Jesus says, Peter, put away your sword. What is wrong with you? And he reaches out and he heals the ear of the high priest's servant. So you can imagine Peter now, they arrest Jesus, they take him away, and Peter's mind is spinning. He's reeling. I mean, he just was rebuked by Jesus for doing the very thing that, that he thought, I mean, he was, he was gonna die for him. And as he's, as he's stumbling along, he follows Jesus to where his trial will take place, and he's out in the courtyard. And he hears all of the angry words all of the trumped up charges, all of the lies. Here's all of the accusations and he knows where this is going. They're gonna kill him and they're going to kill anyone associated with him. And what's worse, Jesus isn't fighting for himself. He's not denying the accusations. He's not saying a single word. And 
along comes a few of the people in the courtyard. Hey, you talk like a, like a Galilean. Are you one of them? No, I don't know him. No, 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 not me. I, I'm not with him. Finally, a little girl approaches him. You were with Jesus. This is Peter exclaims loudly, I don't even know the man. And then Jesus looks at him and the cock crows, right? Says he broke down and wept bitterly. Are you going to leave too? No, Jesus, not a chance. I mean, I'm confused. I'm disillusioned. I don't know what's going on. But you, you are the one with the words of eternal life. We're going to stick with you because we know and believe you are the Holy One of God. And lo and behold, a few short days later, he doesn't even know him. He is so broken, shattered to the core. But here's the thing I want you to understand this morning. Faith is not an emotion. In fact, the truth is, well, well, because we are integrated human beings, faith becomes emotional. It gets connected to our emotions. The truth of the matter is faith isn't even connected to emotion. Faith isn't anything that we do. Faith is a gift from God. The work of God is to believe in Jesus. God is the one who does the work. God who, it's God who creates faith. It's God who sustains faith. It's God who chooses who is saved. God is the one who works this incredible thing of faith. But the fact is, faith is also confusing. Because while it is God's work entirely that we believe, we can't take any credit for it. We're still invited over and over in Scripture to cling to faith. Strange, isn't it? You know, when I think about it, in just my simple terms, the way I think about it is like our confirmation interviews. So lots of you know, and you've had kids, or maybe you've even been through a confirmation interview yourself. You know, there's all kinds of mythology around it and all kinds of anxiety and all kinds of fear. The fact of the matter is I love these kids. I desperately want them to be successful. And the whole point, the whole reason we do the confirmation interview is because I want them to have an opportunity in the safety of my office with someone who loves them and will guide them through whatever confusion they might have. I want them to have the experience of standing up for their faith and saying, I believe because Jesus said so. So when we go through the interview and there we're asking questions and we're moving along and we finally get to that one last question, that one point of pressure where they've been feeling things building and they finally are in that spot where they're not sure, they think they know the answer, but they're a little confused and they feel like maybe I want them to say something different. And, and, and so I ask the question and they're thinking about what they're going to say. Do you know what I'm doing? I'm praying. I'm praying that God will give them the clarity and the strength and the faith to profess what I know they believe. To move beyond the emotion to what they believe. When Jesus says to them, so what's up? Do you want to leave too? You know what I think he was doing? I think he was praying. I think he was praying for his disciples, not just in that moment, but through all the moments that would come because here's what happens. Well, first let me tell you, you know what I think when I think about this? I think it's a little bit like a keychain. So how many have a keychain? How many carry five, 10, 20 loose keys in their pocket, right? Because what's the keychain do? Keeps it all together. So I got a keychain for Christmas. Here it is. There's my truck key on one end and then there's this keychain. It's kind of cool, I'd been seeing these and and so I got this for Christmas and it, it puts the keys together then they all fold in into one little segment. If I had those keys in my pocket, they'd be lost. You notice it's orange. You may say, oh, is orange your favorite color? No, it's not. 
But if that key ring ever ends up somewhere outside of its two designated spots, I need something very bright to catch my attention. Because that's my whole life, right? Church door keys, out, external, internal, house key, mailbox key, and truck key. That is my whole life right there. Now, Julie, Julie has a whole different philosophy. Julie puts her keys wherever she wants to. In fact, the joke in our house is, you know, if she's looking for a key, she'll say, have you seen my keys? And I'll say, I don't know, hon, where'd you put them? And, she, and the invariable answer is, in exactly the same spot, as always, which means wherever she put them down. Mine go into a little bowl. When you walk into the house, it's a little bowl. It's a little leather kind of thing. My keys in my wallet go in there. When I get to the office, there's a table inside my office. Keys and wallet go there. Because if they don't go there, they're, it's a crisis. And that keychain holds it all together. Do you understand? That's what faith is. Faith is this gift from God that holds our lives together, brings all of the parts and pieces together, helps protect and defend my marriage, helps protect and defend my relationship with my kids and my grandkids, helps protect and defend my relationship with my beloved congregation, helps keep my mind clear and focused, helps keep me on track when it comes to what I preach and teach. I mean, my faith is central and essential to my life, and it brings all of these things together, and it keeps them safe in one place. The reason I'm saying that is because when it comes to Peter, Peter loses his faith, panics, loses his keychain, if you will. And at the end of John's gospel, Peter has totally abandoned this whole disciple idea. He's gone back to fishing. And Jesus finds him and he calls him in for breakfast. Remember this? Peter jumps out of the boat. He swims ashore. He gets ashore. He's so excited to see Jesus, but then he doesn't even know what to say because he's, he's walked away. And if you let me tell it in my own way, Jesus pulls this orange keef up out of his pocket, and he says, Peter, I bet you think you lost these. I've been holding them for you. See, while you and I cling to faith, it is God who never lets us go. That's his promise. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Earlier in John's gospel, he says, my father's promise is that none of them that he's given to me will be snatched out of my hands. In the Great Commission, he said, and I will be with you always to the end of the earth. Dear friends, the scripture tells us to cling to our faith in Christ. But while we're holding on for dear life, remember it's God who's holding on to us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your love, grateful for the gift of faith that you've given us. And Father, we pray that even when our emotions cause us to stumble or even want to walk away, Lord, hold us close by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.